Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. Today we've got Mark Ward with us. We're talking about exegetical fallacies. It's a big fancy way of saying how not to read your Bible wrong. It's going to be an exciting program. You guys stay tuned. Nope. Play, play the intro video. There you go. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Hello, one and all. We've got an exciting program for you today. Before we dive into the subject matter uh, and introduce Mark, I want to remind you guys that Remnant Radio is entirely crowdfunded, so there are links in the description if you want to support the channel. You can give a one-time gift on PayPal or a reoccurring gift on Patreon. As low as five bucks a month, you'll get access to extra content there. If you're out there and you say, hey, I can't afford five bucks a month, I understand what it's like. Uh, as I've said on the show before, I have been so poor that my baloney did not have a first name. So you can always shoot me an email at media at theremnantradio.com and I'll give you that content for free. Anyway, without further ado, I want to introduce to you my friends here. I've got Mark Ward there. I've got Michael Roundtree as well. Before I introduce Mark, Michael, you got to give me some witty banter. How is it over there in Oklahoma? It is good. Just saw Top Gun today. Top Gun 2. It was worth the 30 year wait. Really good movie. <laughs> uh yeah so having a good time here happy memorial day uh to everybody if you're watching this on memorial day if you're not i hope you had a great one and i know some of you are outside of our uh outside of the united states of america and that doesn't mean anything to you but uh for those of you who are happy memorial day uh i hope you guys subscribe to the channel and like it this is going to be a great conversation we've had mark ward on the show before check out the other uh, episode that we did with him about the King James only Bible translation. Uh, some of you come from denominations that that's uh, that is the translation of choice. You're definitely going to want to check that out. Or if you're just curious on it, I think you should check it out. And also, you should check out Mark Ward's uh, YouTube channel. It's so good. Uh, Josh and I were talking before the show. It's one of our favorites. So, uh, but uh, so hit that like, hit that subscribe button. We got episodes coming out tomorrow uh, on Wednesday all the time. So. Uh, so make sure you, you tune in. But uh, Mark, I want to hear from you a little bit. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and about, uh, tell us about your YouTube channel, your books, your, uh, your everything. Tell us your life story in 30 seconds. Oh boy, oh boy. Okay, I just wasted three seconds saying oh boy, oh boy. Josh Lewis really helped me with my YouTube channel. Actually, he's given me some of the best advice that I've gotten. The YouTube channel is aimed at bringing the Bible to the plowboy, and that's the positive goal, but sometimes you have to deconstruct some bad things. Maybe I shouldn't use that word in today's uh, 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 climate, but um, you got to pull down some bad walls. And I grew up in King James onlyism. Um, I had a good experience. I wasn't abused spiritually or otherwise. But I came to see that my otherwise beloved Christian school teachers and my pastor back in high school in those days were simply mistaken and were cutting themselves off from good riches in the multiple evangelical English Bible translations that I've now come to enjoy for half my life, a little over it actually. Um, King James onlyism, you know, you might have figured that everything's been said and written on it, it needs to be. And I've discovered, no, actually we needed uh, an angle that focused on English readability and set aside all the textual criticism stuff because it is rather difficult. Though my channel is just now getting into it to that. And uh, in coming weeks, my little textual confidence collective of a couple friends and I, we went down to Dallas, in fact, and recorded seven hours plus of uh, discussions about textual criticism, aiming at producing textual confidence rather than textual absolutism or textual skepticism. That is my YouTube channel. And I live in beautiful state of Washington, Mount Vernon, Washington, work for Faith Life, makers of Logos Bible Software, and I'm the editor of Bible Study Magazine. Well, we uh, love Mark's content. I know Michael just mentioned it uh, at the front. I'll put a link to uh, Mark's uh, YouTube channel in the description of the video. So make sure to go over there and subscribe. Uh, again, the content that Mark produces is is like specialistic, overqualified for today's subject matter. So I'm actually really excited to kind of let some of that shine a little bit today. Uh, Mark, talk to us about exegetical fallacies. I dumbed it down at the beginning of the show to say, how do we don't read the Bible uh, the wrong way? Uh, can you unpack exegetical <laughs> fallacies uh how do we don't read academic, it wrong man you're <laughs> over you, you sort of way you definitely don't use the double negative because that means how do we read it the wrong way well but you'll probably yeah. tell us how to read it the wrong way Look, too so we can learn how to read it the right I, way i need no education to quote the great psalmist <laughs> okay i'm gonna toss it back over to mark for an interpretation 
Well, just like in medicine, you have particular, you know, technical terminology. So one time I was using this, um, this, I, I bought this $60 like badger hair brush and thought, oh, I'm going to get the best shave ever. Sure enough, it just gave me red welts and stuff. And I went in and the doctor said, you have, oh, let's see if I can remember it. Um, oh man, it's been in my year, my, all these years, it was some particular Latin term and, uh, the translation of it is okay. Oh, it came back and then left again. It basically meant red beard. And, uh, uh, but you have to say it in the Latin way in the medical world, or it doesn't count. You know, it was him who was sitting in the white lab coat and had the stethoscope. So he got to use the technical terminology. The word exegesis is kind of like that. That's my point here. It's just Bible interpretation and it's rigorous Bible interpretation. It's what people who live in the world of rigorous Bible interpretation, academic biblical studies use, um, uh, careful expository preaching pastors use to describe their process of Bible interpretation. So an exegetical fallacy is an idea of interpretation that is wrong or unhelpful and yet gets you all the time in Bible interpretation. And uh, enough sort of pitfalls exist, enough common traps that Carson years ago wrote a book called Exegetical Fallacies. And, you know, you really could just go read that book right now and stop listening. It's okay if, if that's what you choose to do instead of watching YouTube. Um, that book is absolutely fantastic. We'll go through some of the ideas that, you know, ultimately are sourced there. I want to get that out there at front. Exegetical Fallacies are Bible interpretation errors, common ones. Okay. Uh, now, Mark, could you talk to us a little bit about the law of first mention? It's something that some people talk about when they're, uh, when they're discussing principles for exegesis. And so uh, law of first mention, what does that mean? Why is it important? Well, I remember when I first heard about the law of first mention, and I do have a whole video about this on my channel, that I shot out in an absolutely beautiful part of Washington State and called Alger. It's up in the mountains on my way uh, to work, and I just stopped over and did that. It was so fun. And uh, I've heard about the law of first mention for many years. And when I first did hear about it, I thought, oh, you know, a law. I mean, that, that sounds really formal. And I totally accepted there must be a law of first mention. And I don't remember who it was, you know, one of the pastors that I had probably back in high school and that King James only church who's law. Um, he didn't actually spell out what the supposed alleged law was, but I gathered from his use of it that the law of first mention was something like whatever the first mention of a given term or concept is in the Bible has some sort of controlling power over all the other uses of it. And um, it's difficult for me to put my finger on anything more definite because I find that with a lot of these exegetic, exegetical fallacies, you know, they're kind of like urban legends. They just get passed around. And you have to really stop and ask yourself, wait a minute, should I be using a law that the Bible doesn't state, number one? Second, what could that even mean, given that we don't really know for sure what the proper order of the Bible books is? So yeah, it makes sense to start with Genesis and end in Revelation, but I've got the uh, NIV Reader's Bible right here, and I've had various Reader's Bibles especially that have used different orders. What does it even mean for scrolls in the Hebrew Bible, you know, back in the days before codices? This is a, a codex form. What did it mean for scrolls to come in an order? Um, and then when I actually watch the way people use this supposed law, I am confirmed in my deep suspicions that there is no such law. And actually what often happens, and I will not pin this on any individual, I won't look at somebody else and say, I know his real motivation was not what he said, but the actual effect is that they end up importing ideas from outside scripture into scripture. So, you know, uh, another way to uh, handle this would be to think, okay, if this really is a law, it should work everywhere, right? So what about the, the word in? In the beginning, God created. That word in, is there some kind of meaning there that ought to control all the other uses of the word in? Or the word beginning, you know, okay, so Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created, that beginning comes from God. So all beginnings come from God. And then that would mean that in Genesis, what was it, 4, 5, or 6, when men began to call upon the name of the Lord, well, God began that beginning. He's the one who made them call upon the name of the Lord. You know, the Calvinists would cheer and the Arminians would boo. 
the law of first mention, like many exegetical fallacies, starts to fall apart as soon as you try to actually apply it. Better, it's better to just read your Bible through and gain an overall sense for how a given concept is uh, explained, unfolded throughout the story of Scripture. Okay, so like the law of fir first mention, just want, I want to keep unpacking this because I think this is probably the first time we've talked about this on Remnant Radio, probably. So uh, I know that people are familiar with it, I'm sure, in the same way that you were from your childhood, um, that, you know, you know, brothers is mentioned first time in Genesis, right? And Cain kills Abel, so we shouldn't take from this that every brother is at least 50% likely to kill his, you know, younger sibling, right? So, like, obviously there's a, a way that that can be taken out of proportion. Can can you off the top of your head, I know I didn't, I didn't prep you with this question, but could you off the top of your head kind of explain a law of first mention that's often used um, in in the book of Genesis? Because again, a lot of them are pulling from Genesis. Uh, maybe tithe would be one that they frequently will talk about Melchizedek. This has to be the interpretive lens for all the others. That's one that I hear a lot. Uh, maybe sacrifices as well. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of them that are frequently used. Could you give us a popular uh, law of first mention that's used in, in pulpits? Yeah, you know, I it is tough to come up with a definite example in part because I find that when ideas are so fallacious, so just obviously erroneous, I have a hard time like making myself remember why people say them. So I'm going to shift to a different topic and come back to that. In the King James only world, a lot of folks want to say that the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament never existed. And I have to like remind myself every time, why do they say that? Oh yeah. Well, in this case, I went on YouTube to look for, you know, people using the law of first mention. And the one I recall was a guy like in Europe somewhere, he had a, an accent speaking English, European accent. And he was saying something about how the first mention of blood in, uh, in Genesis had some bearing on our interpretation of Jesus sacrifice for us. And it sounds so nifty. It sounds like there's this hidden, you know, meaning behind things when you're reading Genesis and, and that's appealing to people both people who are faithful and wanting to know every scrap of meaning that, you know, the Lord has put in his word and people who like my friend in high school who was professed faith very briefly uh, and now is an atheist, a friendly one. But I remember him. He really wanted to read the book of Revelation with me. And even as like a 14 year old, I was like, you know, that's fine, but actually we probably shouldn't be starting there. Oh, he had just this unhealthy fascination really with the stuff that was, you know, uh, hidden and obscure and approved over time. He didn't really have interest in what the Bible was openly saying. I wish I could give a better, more specific example. I don't know if any of you have uh, heard this growing up and can remember one. Uh, that's yeah. I was actually trying to rack my own brain for, um, an example of it. No, I, I can't think of an example offhand, but what you talked about, Mark, I think is a huge issue. And that is people trying to find hidden meaning in scriptures. I had somebody who passed to me uh, like this, this stack of back, this is a few, a number of years ago, um, but it was this stack of CDs. And it was all this guy who had been teaching the real meaning of Hebrew words and how oh. like it completely upends like your understanding of how Judaism operated and therefore how Christianity should operate and, and so on. I just, I listened to one or two and I just told the person, I said, man, this, this guy is so interested in novel interpretations uh, that, that he's just going to lead you down this rabbit hole. And I think that can be a temptation for teachers. Sometimes we want to show something that no one's ever seen before. But I loved what you said, Mark. You, you talked about just the plain meaning of the text. And there's so much power in the plain meaning of the text. We don't need to decipher codes. That's not really what the Bible was written for. So right. uh, I love that. Now, uh, okay, so we, we talk about that as a, a fallacy, the law of first mentions. Uh, but n now let's just continue down this road here. Talk to us about the root fallacy. This also goes by the name, the etymological fallacy or the genetic fallacy. And the key in all of those is you're looking to a word's history to understand its current meaning. This happened to me recently, actually. Um, you have to follow this a little bit, those who aren't familiar with my channel, but if you guys watched a couple of my false friends in the King James video, 
I demonstrate how many individual words in the King James Version that I love, by the way, I've still got tons of King James Version verses memorized. One of them uh, was uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's actually where awana comes from. Approved workmen are not ashamed. I memorized that verse years ago. Whoa. I have demonstrated on my channel. That's yeah, revelation right there, dude. Bro, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. That's pretty novel to me. I've been hearing about Awanas for a minute. I didn't know that's where it came from. Jeez, Louise. That's where it came from. Yeah. <laughs> False friends are words that we think we know what they mean because we still use those words in contemporary English, but they actually had a different set of senses back in 1611. And commonly when I mention these things, like how long halt ye between two opinions? And I mention halt doesn't mean stop. It means limp or but god commendeth his love toward us doesn't mean that god praised his love commended it you know way to go love it means that he set it out on display he showcased it that's a specific meaning a sense of that word commend that we don't have in our english anymore a lot of king james only as will tell me on my channel this has happened actually many times they'll say well you just need to study you know you need to read the king james exclusively and you just need to study it hard so you can understand it and i had to make a video saying I'm getting back to the genetic, genetic fallacy, by the way, um, the uh, or the root fallacy or the etymological fallacy. Um, I had uh, somebody say on my channel, you know, you got to study. And so I, I made a video in which I pointed out, actually, that word study in that context in 1611 in 2 Timothy 2 did not mean hit the books. It meant be diligent. Be diligent to show yourself approved, a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed. And to clench it, that's what the Greek word means there. It's very clear that the King James translators did not mean hit the books. Now, they weren't saying don't hit the books. It's just that's not what study meant. There's another phrase in the uh, New Testament, study to be quiet. And although, you know, I would love for my children to take a class in homeschool, study to be quiet. They're watching TV Amen. right now, so that they'll be quiet. Quiet. Yeah. Um, that's not what that meant. That means, you know, make it your aim to be quiet. So anyway, I had uh, a King James only us go out, actually one of the most intelligent ones. He actually speaks modern Greek. And he said on his uh, channel, actually, what, and he's been like banned on YouTube. So this is gone now, but you just have to trust me. He said, uh, Mark is such an idiot slash fool slash ignoramus. I can't remember what word he used. And he said, Every, you know, in modern Greek, this Greek word happens to be spudazo. It means hit the books. So he was saying that because this Greek word spudazo means today, hit the books, just like study does in English, that that must be what it, had, what it meant 2,000 years ago. But that is the etymological fallacy, the root fallacy, the genetic, genetic fallacy. Just because a word used to mean something doesn't mean that it still means that thing. Um, and this happens all of the time. I mean, I just never stop hearing people commit I was... this little error. I was a Pentecostal and Acts 2, you know, you receive power from on high. You know what this word comes from the word that we made dynamite? Dunamis. Dunamis. Yes. It's dynamite power. So like people are blowing up everywhere once the Holy Spirit comes. <laughs> it's not exactly oh, but, the same thing. Yeah, right, but words, or... words change their meaning so quickly. I mean, I have kids who are teenagers now and they're constantly educating me about what words mean. And I'm like, it that's not what that means. But... But they changed so quick. And of course, it happened to me when I when I was a teenager. I'd be like, man, that's awesome. And, you know, my dad would be like, awesome doesn't mean cool. You know, <laughs> it's just words change so quickly. So you, you can't look at what something means way down the line. In fact, Mark, what would you say is is like a fair range of like, you know, if, if you want to compare what a what a word meant in Paul's day to classical Greek? Does it need to hit a range of like within 100 years, within 20 years, within 300 years? What would you yeah. say if you were just shooting from the hip there on this? Really, there really is no rule of thumb. Um, it it can change quickly. Um, I Let me push back a little bit there because I think what you're talking about with your teenagers and I have a 12 year old coming up on 13, I've seen this kind of thing too. And I've been in youth ministry. I think we're talking about slang and awesome and cool and gnarly and rad um words for you know um not just approbation of something but social approbation of something there's there's a degree to which you actually kind of want to exclude others from that you know because to be cool is to to for your group to be setting aside itself as distinct but actually english doesn't change all that fast and one of the reasons i know that is that 
my wife and I watch BBC shows all the time. That's like the only thing we're watching nowadays. And yes, there are times when they use particular words that, you know, we don't use the same way, but we can understand really well. Um, even a whole ocean separating us doesn't keep us from being able to understand one another. Print and all kinds of writing is like roots in the soil of a language. It's when a language is only spoken that it can change really rapidly and people don't really have a sense for it happening. You know, um, languages are always changing no matter where you look in the history of any given language. It changes even Esperanto, which is one of the few humanly invented languages that exist that people actually speak. It has changed since it was invented, I believe in the 20th century. I read a great book on this called In the Land of Invented Languages. So we don't need to be worried that, you know, our language is going to disintegrate into nothing at the mercy of these teenagers when they grow up. You know, they're just going to be grunting <laughs> at uh, one another. Um, and because what actually, when we say that to conservative Christians, and I am one, right? I believe in the inerrancy of the Bible. I'm a conservative Christian. They get really up in arms. And I had a dear older man, a really gifted man, really go after me in a large Sunday school class in my very conservative church in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, to which I owe such a great debt. That wasn't my King James only church, by the way, that was my college church. Uh, he actually brought me out of King James onlyism. And for like 10 whole minutes, he had me pinned to the wall when I was trying to explain that language changes over time. He heard postmodern relativism in that, and he wanted to push back. But if you don't get that language changes over time, then you're going to import meaning from whatever period into the New Testament period, or you're going to get Greek and English all confused. You're going to do the same in English. So it's really important to recognize that you want to look at what's called a synchronic um, evaluation of language. You've got diachronic means through time, down the timeline. Synchronic means one spot on the timeline. What did that Greek word mean when Paul used it? Um, we can say the same about English, of course, but ultimately the authority here is Hebrew and Greek. And I really think that um, people who aren't specialists in Greek and Hebrew can still and must still have some understanding of this fallacy so that when they do Bible word studies, they aren't tripped up. Okay, so with, with the... I, I know I gave an example of dunamis, and I know that you had another example on the tip of your tongue, uh, but Michael's, Michael's question was... Uh, when he talked about within the range of a certain period. So your argumentation would be, or your, your explanation would be, you don't necessarily need to find that word or that phrase in that specific decade or in that specific millennium, um, but generally the use of that phrase and its frequency will help you figure out what that that phrase or word means. Is that, is that what I understand yeah, so you saying? I might have been a little bit confusing here because I first said there isn't a rule of thumb. Um, right. Like Here's what I meant that, for example, as I recall, the word sack occurs in English and it means, you know, a burlap bag or something. And actually, you know what the Hebrew word, the ancient Hebrew word for sack is? It's sack. This is a word that I guess is naming such a common thing that throughout multiple languages, it's been a couple of years since I looked at this one, please forgive me out there, word nerds, if I'm wrong about it. But as I recall, it's the same in multiple languages and it hasn't changed over millennia. Um, because the basic mm -hmm. thing called a sack hasn't changed over millennia, you know, not appreciably. So there are words like that that just stick around and stick around and stick around. Hallelujah uh, means praise the Lord in English today as it did in Hebrew thousands of years ago. Um, so it's not necessarily true that we have to look at a really tight window, but in general, we're, we are looking at uh, as narrow a window as we can make to determine what a given word meant. You know, sometimes, um, so can I give an example here? Um, agape Absolutely. and agapao. Do you mind if I put you guys on the spot? And I've done this to hosts before when I've been interviewed oh. and they get so nervous. You have okay, to here trust goes. Me. Michael, Michael okay. was trained by the, the former Hebrew Greek guy that knows a bunch of languages. So I'm gonna make him answer this question. Okay. Great. Okay. It's not going to be super hard. Thanks. And actually, I'm not going to make you report what you think, but what you've heard. So oh, what have ah, you heard off the hook. that agape and agapao mean in Greek? So that's the noun and verb forms of one of the, you know, the main Greek word for love in the New love. Testament. What yeah. does it mean? Right. That typically what is said is that it's God's unconditional love is what it means. Yeah. Right. I mean, but I've, I've read it in, uh, I want to say... As agape is, is Greek, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So uh, that, that's typically what I hear of of love. It's a God kind of love. It's a, it's a love that God will stir in your heart. That's typically what I hear. Agapao. I don't even know if I know what the other one, when that one is used. Uh, well, it'd be the difference yeah. of love versus to love. But, right. but yeah, anyway, that's now what I, is that the points. answer you were expecting us yeah. to say? Yeah, of what exactly. people say about it? Right. Right. Um, so I have to ask you what you what you really think. Um, can I ask? Has this been discussed on this channel before? Have you talked no. about this word? No, knock no. it out of the park, man. Then, All right. This Are you going to go to John twenty one? Slay um, these golden cows. Ultimately, we're going to get there. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. But you know, right, we we could it. start there. Let's start there because there is no law of first sure. mention. We can start wherever we want, right? Dang. So in John twenty one, <laughs> I remember when my bible teacher my freshman year of college who by the way was my pastor for 18 years everybody who knows me will know who this is and is an awesome bible teacher the best i have ever heard nonetheless among the very few times in 18 years of countless excellent sermons um where i i heard him say something that i've ultimately come to disagree with and he wasn't being as responsible as i think he should have been in this case I think he picked this up when he was a younger man anyway. He said that in John 21, when Jesus and Peter have this famous discussion, you know, do you love me? Well, then feed my sheep. Yes, I love you. Um, that Jesus varies the Greek words for love there between agapao, which supposedly is this unconditional godlike love, and phileo, which is a mm -hmm. friendship love. And uh, Jesus supposedly says, do you agape me? And Peter says, well, I phileo you. No, do you agape me? Oh, I phileo you. Well, do you even phileo me? Oh, Lord, you know. And um, it really preaches well. And it's that same impulse. Oh, there's something hidden. There's some hidden meaning in here that we can't see in English. And it feels so nifty. You, you really you feel superior to other people. Or let me put a more charitable spin on it. You feel like, oh, wow, now I've got the hidden key to truly understanding what this passage says. But if we're going to apply our knowledge of how language works, we're going to look at how that word agapao is used and how that word phileo is used. And you can do this in Logos Bible software or even with like blue letter Bible. You can just search. And even if you don't know Greek mm -hmm. or Hebrew, you can find that Strong's number. And you can look at every place where agapao occurs. And if you do that, you're going to see passages like this. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Agapao, agapao, agapao. What could it mean to love the world if agapao is a special form of godlike love? That doesn't make sense. Or Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Agapao. Or the Pharisees love the chief seats at the feast or greetings in the marketplaces, agapao. The word cannot mean a godlike love because in the time of the New Testament, it wasn't used that way. You go back a little bit further in time, and we generally consider that the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, um, is about the same kind of Greek, Koine Greek it's called, or common Greek as the New Testament. And actually, as uh, it's 2 Samuel 13, you've got Tamnon after he, uh, Tamnon, uh, Amnon, after he raped his half-sister Tamar, it says in the Septuagint that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. Guess what Greek word they use there? Agapao. So wow. it cannot mean mm. a godlike love. Or I was just you listening. That Septuagint my, on us. That's uh, awesome. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the <laughs> NIV audio Bible I was listening to. And at the very end is it of First Corinthians, I think it is First Corinthians 16, I want to say, if anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. That's like I was I was in the shower, actually, and it like plastered me to the wall, even though I've read this verse countless times. Wow, that's like really bold there, Paul. And I happen to recall that's not agapao, that's phileo. So when you actually look at the way the words actually get used, which is the same way everybody learns language when you're a kid, you just notice how words get used. You don't have a dictionary that you can look up and it wouldn't matter if you did because you can't read. You notice that agapao and phileo are used kind of interchangeably. And it really just boils down to the English word love. It's just like our word love. You can love ice cream. You can love your grandma. You can love going to the state fair and you can love God and love Jesus. And yeah, those loves may be different, but the, English and Greek don't parse those loves out so finely and assign them to definite, you know, Greek words. So John 21 is not trying to say something subtle in Greek that we're all missing. Actually, it's mm -hmm. just Carson would say, you know, stylistic variation.
and, and this is not like a, a hot take on Mark Ward's opinion on this phrase. Like you're saying every person who's reading their Bible can go to Blue Letter Bible, look at that Greek word. I mean, literally every person. It's a free online right. software. Just check out the phrase or <laughs> logos it. This isn't like your personal opinion. Like this is an actual thing that can be verified and tested well, by a lay I know person. That it, I know that it can because the reason I knew you might go to John 21 is because I had this exact same thought process when I preached John 21 some years ago and I was like, wait a minute, this is not how the people said it is. And um, it's exactly like what Mark said. So um, anyway, what what uh, fallacy would you call this? Because this seems, uh, this is not, it, I don't think it falls under law of first mention or root fallacy, uh, or does it fall under root fallacy and I'm not quite seeing it? Um, yeah, it depends would on you the just formulation. Call it, or would you just call it bad exegesis? There's, there's no <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could just call it that. I mean, this this example does come from Carson's book, Exegetical Fallacies. It's also a, yeah. a great book by Moises Silva called Biblical Words and Their Meaning. And Silva, who's one of my favorites, he actually graduated from my alma mater also years ago, many decades before me. Um, he studied under James Barr, who was a famous uh, linguist. And um, what what Barr and especially Silva have called this is theological lexicography lexicography mm. is just the production of dictionaries and oh, yeah. there's just this impulse and i understand it and and actually i to a degree i sympathize with it you want to find as much meaning as god has placed in the bible you don't want to miss anything and if someone is offering you greater riches i mean that's why i loved listening to that pastor that i just you know mildly criticized for that one very you know rare error of his uh, theological lexicography acts like every one of these important New Testament Greek words is just freighted with all kinds of theological meaning. You know, it's kind of a special Holy, Holy Spirit language. But I, I think it really ought to be possible, yes, for the lay person who doesn't read Hebrew or Greek to just be armed with this idea that freighting individual Greek and Hebrew words with a lot of theological meaning that you can't see in your English translation is generally bad it usually doesn't go somewhere bad like the actual sermons i hear where preachers do this they what they end up saying is still true it's just not drawn from that passage and it's not something you could get out of your individual bible study you have to have the priestly cast to tell you and i think evangelicals generally know and are you know bones that no the bible is the possession of the individual christian and not just the, the priestly cast the the pastors yeah. god's given us those teachers we ought to listen to them you know i am one you you guys are teachers but it you ought to be able to if somebody says agapao means and agape means this special kind of godlike love for example i always heard that doesn't contain any emotion well, you ought to be able to find a sentence in your Bible that describes love that way. I don't think you should just take it on the authority of whatever pastor is telling you what a Greek or Hebrew word means. You ought to say, wait a minute, where does the Bible say in a sentence or paragraph or story that love properly is unconditional and carries you know, little to no emotion or no necessary emotion? I think that's right. something lay people can and should do. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's especially helpful if you can, if you have other examples in the scripture, and especially if you're studying a book of the Bible to see how this particular author is using that word. I think that's really helpful in exegesis. But there are those, uh, those few words in the New Testament, uh, or the Old Testament for that matter, uh, where it's only used one time in the Bible. And it's a controversial passage. So oh, take First Timothy like, chapter two. We, we've yeah. been submitting. Oh, you beat me to it. Oh, yeah. yeah. First Timothy two, though. Um, we we were uh, well. I won't I won't say who we were interviewing because I don't want to throw the person under the bus or anything. Um, but the the person uh, the person came from a non complementarian perspective. And hey, we have egalitarian brothers and sisters in Christ. So so not throwing shade on any of them. Right. But um, anyway, their understanding of that single Greek word for exercise authority. So I do not allow a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. When I asked this person, you know, what, what was their understanding of this passage? The response was, well, that word uh, is shown to mean something like usurp. And it can mean something like, you, you know, in classical Greek, it can mean murder. And you know, we, we, we try to be nice hosts, so we kind of stopped pushing back at that point. But uh, 
I, I do know. I mean, I've studied it before. And Mark, I, I'm betting that you probably know better than me. But I, I think it's like that word in classical Greek, it's something like hundreds of years later when it has the meaning murder, that it's that, that it's nowhere within that vicinity. Now, if you don't know that that data point, that's totally fine. But my, my point is, uh, really is a question, what do we do in situations when it is only used one time in the Bible? Yeah, it's called a neologism or a coinage. Um, briefly on authentain, and that's one of those words I've been meaning to get into and study. So far, I've been just tending to rely on people I trust. But as soon as you said that, that, that you know, uh, supposed meaning of murder, my mind went right to a phrase in Carson's exeg exegetical fallacies. Um, and he, he labels one of them appeal to unknown or unlikely meanings as one of the exegetical fallacies. Mm, and one of the points of just going through that book, just learning some of these fallacies, learning labels for them is just to be armed with that, uh, that label so that when you encounter it, you're at least that much more likely to, to notice it. <clears throat> let me, let me offer uh, an answer to your question here that actually, uh, technically, um, isn't right because this word occur occurs more than once, but when, um, when Paul uses the word arsenokoites in 1 Corinthians 6, you asked about um, actually what they're called is hapax legomena, spoken once, mm -hmm. you know, word that's only used one time. You basically have the same problem if it's only used twice. You know, right. there's, there's only those contexts to go on. And if it's not, especially this is true of the Hebrew Bible, but it can be true of these coinages in the New Testament, you may or may not have um, literature outside the Bible to appeal to, to help you gain a sense for how this word was used at the time. Again, that's particularly true of the Old Testament, because basically the biblical Hebrew we have, almost all of it is Old Testament. But when Paul invents this word, arsenokoites, and as best we can tell, he did, that's actually the only time when you, you ought to, and you kind of must go beyond context uh, to help understand the meaning of the word and actually go ahead and look at the root. So this can get a little confusing because I just got done saying, you know, there's a root fallacy appealing to the etymology of the word, you know, is usually wrong. Well, in this case, it's not wrong because even the original readers of First Corinthians, all they would have had to go on is the, the different portions of this word arsenokoites. And I'll explain what that means real quick. Basically, arsen is male and koites is like better. Or I'm sorry to say this, it's like the F word. It's an f -er. Okay, so there were in Greek already words, just like in English, mother effer and wow. uncle effer and brother effer. I'm sorry to have to be so, you know, crass here, but that is what Paul did. I'm not saying he used the equivalent of the F word, um, but it was a bold word and it's man effer, it, man better. Um, to be super literal about it. And those are the two Greek words that get used in the Levitical prohibitions in Leviticus 19 in the Septuagint, that Greek translation of the Old Testament. So that is a time when we have to look at the constituent parts of a word to determine its meaning. Um, if we had lots more uses, we wouldn't have to do that. And actually we would try to avoid it. We want to look right. at how the word was used in that time. So, you mean, you could, you have preachers today that make up words for the use of their sermon or politicians who make up a word for a specific situation by putting two words together that sure. had not formerly been put together at any other time or that we know of, right? Um, you know, we even think of like turning nouns. I don't even know if this is a great example, but like we talk about, um, we don't have a word for possession. We have demonization, right? We're adding an I-O-N uh -huh. to it. So like we're turning a noun into a verb so you can, you know, like I, I write ish on the end of everything. Like if I was in a sermon and I was like, that's biblical ish. Like that's probably not, uh -huh. a, and it's probably, it's not a word, but people would know what it means in the immediate hearing in that audience. Is that, is that the yeah. same thing that you're talking about? Like it's never been oh, used? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Right. So actually you made me think of Calvin, not Calvin, the theologian, but Calvin drawn by Bill Watterson who commented to Hobbes <laughs> verbing weirds language. Um, that, that can be true, but how did we understand, how come we can understand that verbing never heard that before I read that weirds never heard anybody use weird as a verb. How come that still came across? It's because we understand what are called the morphemic elements. Okay. If you, um, I, I love this video on YouTube, some linguist who's 
training young people about language. And she, she drew a picture and she put it up on the screen. She said, this is a wug. And it looked like a little dust bunny with eyes and a, a smile. And then she had, she put a, a second one next to it. And she said, these are two, and she left the blank open. And all the kids in the audience said, wugs. How did they know to say that when they never heard of a wug? It's because they know that you put S on the end of a word and it makes it um, uh, plural in that case. So um, that's a morphemic element. That S carries meaning. That's what happens when you put the S on the end of weird and that's what makes it a verb. That's what happens when you put the ING, which is an existing you know, piece of our language. You put it on the end of verb and it becomes a verb, verbing. That's what happens when you put ish on the end of something. That's a morphemic element. And that is similar, yes, to what Paul did. And, you know, you might complain, you might say, Paul, you're supposed to use utterly clear language. And, you know, many people say that Greek is the most precise human language, you know, ever known to man, because they don't want places of ambiguity or difficulty or unclarity in God's word. That just isn't the way God did it. We've got to interpret this language like we do normal language. And that means that sometimes, in fact, frequently, we're not going to be uh, seeing things that are infinitely precise. Um, a lot of my work is just clearing away bad ideas uh, that have kind of collected around Bible interpretation. Again, out of that motivation, we really want to understand and not miss anything. And I'm saying the best thing to do is often just clear that away and listen like you would if you were in Corinth and somebody just read the letter that Paul wrote to your church just now. They wouldn't have all these technical things in mind. Um, they would just listen like normal human language. Mm. So you, you wrote your dissertation on Paul's religious affections. Um, did you find a bunch of exegetical fallacies while you were putting that together? I sure did. And uh, sometimes I just have to laugh. My wife really laughs at one of them to this day. It was you know a good 10 years ago now. Um, but I was looking in the Baker exegetical, I'm sorry, the Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible. <clears throat> and there's this sort of move afoot, very, very similar to what we talked about with Agape and Agapao where because Westerners often believe in what's called the priority of the intellect, you know, we often act as if our intellect is unfallen and needs to therefore rule our emotions rather than seeing both a uh, reason and feeling emotion affection as created by God and therefore fundamentally good, but also twisted by the fall. So your reason can be good, it can be twisted. Your, your emotions can be good, they can be twisted. Um, I saw that people were trying to strip emotion out of uh, divine commands. And Paul says multiple times in the New Testament, you know, imitate me, um, follow me. And I argued that his emotional life was an aspect of his character that we ought to be following. I mean, if love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself are the most important commands, then of course, the emotional life of somebody like the Apostle Paul is some kind of norm for us when the Holy Spirit inspires him to, to tell us to, to follow him. So a uh, Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible, though, came to this word joy, which in Greek is essentially just like the English word. It means exactly what it does in English, being very happy about something. And it said in this entry, and I, I'll kind of mix up the quote here, I'm just going from memory, there are two kinds of joy in the Bible. There's normal human joy and there's biblical joy. It's an actional hmm. joy. And, it, and as an example, it said, you know, the normal human joy is like, actually today, this very day on Facebook, a missionary friend of mine, he was like raking in the yard and he lost a precious ring that his father had given him. You know, his, his father is long deceased and he was begging people to help him find it. And some friends with a metal detector came and helped him. And he said, everybody rejoice. And I said, it's just like, you know, Luke 15, when um, they find the lost sheep, and when they find the lost coin, that's regular human joy, Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible said. But it said, then there's biblical joy, actional joy. And as an example, we were talking about our wives before we got on here. As an example, it said, um, uh, in Proverbs, it says, find joy in the wife of your youth with no reference to what she may be like. And I had to puzzle over that for a minute. I was like, what are they saying? No, they're basically saying that you get to a point in marriage where you can't actually take emotional joy in your wife, so it must be some kind of action you perform. So my wife and I just laugh about this to this day, you know, actional joy, that's what we try to have in our marriage, you know, feeling is immaterial, it's irrelevant. No, when the Bible says, take joy in the wife of your youth, it doesn't have some special hidden meaning that you can tack on, it, it just means be happy in her, like her a lot love her. Uh, and, and I saw repeatedly with 
gratitude, with hope, with joy, and with love. Those are the four that I focused on. That's kind of the impulse people have to pull the emotion out. You know, Piper says, and I, I was going off in a way on this in part because of Piper's influence on my life. He says people resist the idea that God can command emotions. And absolutely they do. It's like he's not allowed to do that, but he very directly does it. And the only way you can get out from under that or, you know, lower the bar that God raises so high, um, the only way you can get out from that is to redefine what those uh, those words are supposed to mean. Yeah, I've been working on uh, just some like reading some stuff in the the patristic period and uh, not patristic period. I'm sorry, the, the the mystics in particular, and they make this big case for the imagination. So I've just I've been actually scouring the scriptures. I've talked to Michael and Dawson, and a few of my friends, like trying to find a place where imagination is so explicitly stated. I mean, we have the mind, we have thought, and could that include imagination? But but because the Western mind is so allergic to the idea of imagination it, it's like i'm trying to find a, a, a proof text that so you know exclusively is talking about imagination in a kind of glorified sanctified imagination but it's just not there um because i'm looking for something that is probably included in the the larger concept of mind heart thinking those kinds of things right. yeah right but yeah, and included in the aesthetic, I mean, the, the fact that the Bible comes in these aesthetic forms. It isn't just a list of rules. It isn't just a story. But when it is a story, it's often an imaginatively compiled story and an artfully compiled story. That itself indicates something about the place of the imagination. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I want to say one thing that's going to go back to what we talked about earlier. And I just want to reference one of your videos, Mark. And uh, so people can go back and watch because I'm just expecting there are going to be some people that need to watch this. But uh, I understand. Uh, and then I'm going to ask you a question that's totally different. But uh, you did a video on the lexicography of the word homosexual. And um, yeah. I just want to if you want to say anything about that video, you can, but um, I just want to refer your people uh, to that video. Now I'm going to hop to my question. And and my question is, just as Josh talked about kind of, okay, 10 years ago, exegetical fallacies you found in your dissertation, I'm interested in, because this is a, an area of just continual study for you, what are some of the recent exegetical uh, fallacies that you've discovered? Yeah, uh, thankfully, comparatively few of them are as serious as misunderstanding that word arson equites. But this very day, I or was it this very yesterday? I can't remember. Within the last 24 hours, I ran across, uh, no, it was in Christianity Today. I was reading it last night. Um, they referenced the new revised standard version updated edition. And just like the RSV in the 1950s became infamous among conservative Christians for translating Isaiah 714 with the word young woman instead of virgin, you know, behold, a young woman will conceive. And that was, it was uh, perceived then as having a liberal bias, um, at least in that verse. And that really just trashed conservatives trust in it, you know, almost completely, especially at the grassroots level. Um, the NRSV, is threatening to do the same thing with 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And I'm going to get this a little bit wrong, but I, the broad idea is going to be right. And they translate that word as men who practice illicit sex, but that isn't what the word means. And I, I wanted to know, what does this word mean? And for that video, I uh, actually wrote this as a paper, an academic paper a couple of years ago. And I, I recognize if if ever I get persecuted, you know, and I don't have a death wish and I'm not being alarmist, you know, the Lord has had mercy on us all these years. We still have religious liberty. I'm not worried about people watching that video on my YouTube channel and kicking me off. Um, I have a lot of freedoms. Anyway, though, if I'm ever going to get persecuted, it probably is going to be because of my biblical view of sexual morality. That would be my best guess. So I want to make sure I'm standing on the Bible and not on my biases or prejudices or tradition, mere tradition. I want to be able to say, here I stand, God helping me, I can do no other. And I looked very, very carefully at all the arguments going back and forth about arson coites. And those go on at a very high level. This is not, you know, your people going back and forth on, you know, Facebook debates. These are really capable scholars who know what they're talking about. And I will never say they're a bunch of dummies because they are not. Uh, and, and I really put some work into the exegetical fallacies, naming them, labeling them. This really isn't the place to go into 
all those details because it necessarily gets uh, complicated. But I do refer others to the to that video. Just recently, though, um, exegetical fallacies, I I do hear, and I, I kind of got to be gentle. Um, the difficulty is when you sit in church, um, uh, like I do, you know, every single Sunday, most of the examples of the exegetical fallacies that I hear are going to be from my own Sunday school teachers and pastor. And uh, that's <laughs> awkward to have to talk about. I have to say publicly, I've been at this church I've been, uh, that I'm at now very briefly, and everybody's been a great teacher. They've been very responsible. One time we had a guest who said one thing about a passage in Ephesians where I felt like he, he appealed to a supposed grammatical rule and just something in my gut said, you know, I haven't looked at that passage in a long time, but I've been trying to shape myself into somebody who just gets language at a gut level. And I'm just not buying it. Not unless authorities I really respect tell me. So I'm sorry, but during the sermon, I real quick looked up in Logos and my commentaries, and I can't give the specific example lest I, uh, you know, alert uh, friends at my church to this <laughs> guest speaker's little uh, faux pas. The sermon was otherwise excellent. It truly was. And I didn't stop listening. But sure enough, the commentators are saying, no, you're, you're trying to read too much into this. I wish I could be more specific. I'll give one. Um, I just I just did a video actually right in this room right before we recorded on italics in Bible translations. And maybe you couldn't count this as an exegetical fallacy, but broadly speaking, a Bible interpretation problem. Ruth 3.15 says that Boaz said to Ruth, here, give me your shawl or you know, open up your shawl and I will give you six of barley um, and and then he laid it on her, you know, he, he gave her this barley, but it doesn't say six what of barley, six pounds, six ephahs, six sias. So most translations just go with six measures of barley, but the New King James Version puts in, in italics six ephahs. This is pretty obscure, but this pastor made a point out of it. And he said, you can only trust Bible translations if they use italics, which I also disagree with. I think that's not ultimately helpful because I don't think italics are helping people aside from those who read Hebrew. Hebrew and Greek. Anyway, he said, because ephahs isn't really in there, he appealed back to Rashi, who is a 12th century Jewish commentator. And he is kind of well known, but, you know, certainly not by the people in his congregation, this guy's congregation. And he said, Rashi said, it wasn't six measures of barley, it was six barleys, like six barley corns. And these, those represented six blessings that Boaz was trying to give to Ruth. And I'm thinking, no, 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 no. You just told everybody in your congregation, don't trust a translation unless it has italics. And then you said, you told them something that they could not have known by reading their Bibles. And you appealed to somebody they've never heard of. You just undermined their trust in their Bible translations in front of them, if they weren't italicized, and in their ability to read the Bible. Again, you're, you're, you're feeling like you have to give them something nifty that they haven't seen before, so they'll, so they'll be impressed by you. I don't know. I, I don't want to pin that motivation on him, but I hear it so often, it's hard to avoid thinking that. Um, and, and I'm just like shaking my head, don't do this. That's the most recent exegetical fallacy I've heard. Yeah, that's you, you really go oh go. You really do enjoy like picking apart your Sunday school teachers and your pastors <laughs> and your preachers, yeah. no. too, right? <laughs> oh yeah, this this is tough. Like, um I really I kind of wrestle with this because my mind bends toward these things. And I wanna but I wanna say the reason my mind bends toward exegetical fallacies, that is keeping track of them, making sure I don't commit them, is it never was originally in order for me to catch others. It was to catch myself. That same pastor that I praised, I was under for 18 years, who was the best expositor I've ever heard. He instilled in me more so by example than by direct teaching, a holy fear that if I ever stand up in front of other people the way I'm doing right now, and I say, thus saith the Lord, that I need to be representing him accurately. I am a herald. That's one of the fundamental uh, metaphors that the New Testament uses okay. for, you know, Bible teachers and preachers. And I, I live in holy fear, the right kind of fear, not the craven fear that says, Lord, I knew you're a hard master. So I hid this Bible in the dirt and here you have your Bible back. No, I'm going to preach that message. I'm going to see if I can get tenfold, fiftyfold, you know, fruit from it. Um, but all the same, he is a uh, he is going to have an exacting judgment of teachers. James 3, 1, don't many of you be teachers because you'll be judged with a stricter judgment. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't have God tapping me on the shoulder and saying, uh, you know, that's not actually what I said. It has, you know, this kind of study has the, um, the effect, though, of 
making me feel awkward sometimes when I sit in sermons. So I'm thankful to say that I'm in a church where I don't have to sit there and feel uncomfortable all the time. I really am in the hands of careful, responsible Bible teachers who've been trained well. Now, Mark, uh, I'm going to quote Jack Deere. He's, again, the guy who discipled Michael. Uh, lexicographer speaks more languages than humanly necessary. Um, uh, but Jack says he'll listen to someone preach a sermon and they'll quote the Greek and Hebrew and his estimation is, and again, I'm not going to get these percentages perfectly. Michael will probably correct me. 90% of the time they're wrong. And the other yeah. 10% of the time, it's just a synonym and it's completely unhelpful. You could have just read the Bible translation and came right. to that same conclusion. And, and I think he said virtually never is it actually helpful. Michael, did I get that quotation close? Uh, no, that that's exact. And people would also ask him, you know, which Bible translation should I use? And he'll he'll say, use the one that says love your enemies. And and oh, his I point is, it. yeah. <clears throat> and, and his point is the the plain meaning of the text, and as is translated, the translations are really good. And if and if you right. get a pastor, and the other thing he says about Greek and Hebrew is he says the fact that somebody's been to seminary and they have learned the languages, he says it doesn't mean anything because you have to pretty much teach in the languages and use it every single day for years to really wield it well. So you know, uh, I, I, he told me to he told me to in his instruction to me, he told me, uh, don't he, he said study the Greek and Hebrew, but don't uh, yeah. don't say the Greek means this or the Hebrew means that. You're probably just mm -hmm. showing off if you are. Um, I, I so I do it. I do break his rule occasionally because when I'm teaching people to preach, I tell them, I give them kind of like you know rules, if you will. But then I say, but all these rules are made to be broken. So yeah. So anyway. I only bring that up because I want to know your estimation of that. Like, do you find that to be? a normal case as it because most of the guys who get in the pulpits are pastors right their their right. primary training is to care for the people in front of them and the the best of them will typically source scholars who have been doing all the nitty-gritty time not necessarily working with people but working with things working with the language working right. with stuff right. um so the good pastors source you know the people who are good with things uh, and that's a great way for things to work but do you find that to be normal for when you hear the Greek says this, the Hebrew means that, that it's typically just wrong or unhelpful. Absolutely. <laughs> and I was interviewing Tom Schreiner, who is super gracious. If you know him, I oh, yeah. he's been on the channel. Yes. Um, yeah, he has done multiple commentaries and he made me, the interviewer, feel like I was the guest and he was the host because he was so just welcoming. And I'm like thinking, this guy's incredibly busy and productive and he's doing this for me. It was really great. And I kind of tentative, tentatively bounced almost exactly that same thought off of him. And I said, I feel like this is one of the few things that I find myself saying regularly that I also find myself sort of cringing at because it sounds so arrogant. But he said the same thing. Almost every single time I ever hear preachers mention Greek or Hebrew, it is either wrong or I have to tell myself, no, he's not just showing off. No, he's not just showing off. Um, I have to like purposefully choose to be charitable. Um, and it's not because I always know what that Greek word really means. And I know that what he's saying is wrong. It is often what you say that in, in that 10% um, is just not necessary. It's only saying what the Greek says. I might put the percentages a little bit differently um, just to be hopefully a little bit more charitable. Um, but I think he's, I'm, I would make, I'm not saying Deer's being uncharitable, but 90, oh, no, it's that's, okay. I'll say it. Pretty... Jack, Jack, okay. Jack, if you're watching, we know that you've been uncharitable before. So. <laughs> I, but I, I might say 70, 30, like, and, and cause frequently it's true. They're, they're using this to make some kind of point that people can't verify with their English Bibles. And I, I wish I could communicate sufficiently to lay people. I'm trying, you know, with my humble little YouTube channel, communicate to them, you know, really, you can just trust the good Bible translations that have been handed to you. Yes, you need to be aware in general, there are more formal and literal translations and less formal and literal translations. That's helpful. But they're all saying the same thing. Don't be so suspicious. And if you hear your good pastor that you have good reason to respect, and he's casting some kind of, you know, 
creating some kind of distrust in, in your Bible in front of you and saying, actually, it really should be translated this way. Show him grace, be humble toward him. He probably does still, of course, know more than you about the Bible, but he probably doesn't know more than the, you know, a couple dozen uh, lifelong PhDs who uh, got their PhDs at age three, you know, and uh, translated that Bible. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, I, I can't think of a single example anytime I've ever heard Greek or Hebrew mentioned in a sermon where I felt like it was necessary and helpful. I do think in general, there are certain words like agape and logos, um, hallelujah, amen, that come straight from Greek and Hebrew. It's okay to say that. They've kind of become English words. And I would mention them only to clear away false ideas that have kind of collected around them. That or something like a Hosanna. I, I do remember that preacher, a pastor of mine, he would explain what that meant, you know, etymologically. And uh, that was genuinely helpful for me understanding. But he he also had a congregation absolutely full of seminary students, and he could kind of get away with that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're at about that time of the show where we need to, to start wrapping it up. And Mark, I'm about to toss it up, uh, over to you, ask if you have any summarizing thoughts. And, and also, if you have any further resources uh, that you can point us to for how we can avoid exegetical fallacies. And maybe in that list of further resources, you can let us know how we can read your dissertation. But anyway, I'm about <laughs> to toss that over to you. But before I do, I want to toss it over to Josh. Josh, do you have uh, any sort of nutshell thought that you want to close us out with today? Yeah, no, I like uh, the, the one thing that Mark kept bringing up that I just admire so much is is really it's so protestant getting people back to the original material having them read it for themselves check the source material what does it say logically in the flow of the text is does, does that word really change the entire meaning of this thing how do we resource people to read online commentaries that are free go you know to a bible gateway go to a blue letter bible if you if you've got the money to fork out for logos fork the money out for logos uh, go read some commentaries on the subject but there's tons of free resources at your disposal right now um and you know it, it is a bit of a pessimistic um perspective but I, I do feel like we have more resources than ever in human history accessible to the lay person and i find that we're doing a really poor job of equipping them with those resources. Um, so I, I do think that if you're out there and you're worried, man, can I understand what the Bible means? It's so separated from me in history and in time and in language. The culture is so different. Can I ever really truly understand the scriptures? I would just say that there are there are more tools at your disposal right now than there ever has been in human history, just for the lay person, not even for the, you know, exquisite billionaire theologian who can afford, you know, the silver package of logos. Uh, sorry, I'm just kidding. Uh, there uh, there but, are but, lots of billionaire theologians. Man, uh, if you want to yeah. make it big, All six be of them. a theologian. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they're they're crazy wealthy. That they're not. Um uh uh we we know all all, all six of them. Uh anyway, uh all that to say that uh Man, I, I find it encouraging, I find it inspiring that the texts themselves, the translations that we have today are are enough and that, that we should have like faith and courage. We're talking to a guy who, like I said, is overly qualified to talk about Bible translations uh, and, and to talk about Greek and Hebrew words and just to find that his overwhelming conclusion is your NIV study Bible is going to be enough. Uh, I think that should be the the greatest takeaway for the hearers today is, is read your Bible, read it frequently read it in context, um, and, and read commentaries when things don't quite make sense. And I think that uh, a lot of these kind of biblical interpretations just kind of resolve themselves, I think, when we do those things. Those are my only thoughts. Michael, did you, do you have something before you want to toss it over to Mark? Or? Oh, well, sure. Yeah. Um, I'll be quick. I, Mark, I just love the way you articulated the fear of God and how it drove you to this, that it wasn't the desire to pick apart other people, but that there's just this fear of trembling. I've read before that Charles... Charles Spurgeon, before he preached to these huge audiences, he would be almost immobilized with trembling sometimes. And that the reason was not because he was nervous to preach, but because he feared God and wanted to represent him well. And I, I just think uh, Isaiah 66, that, that we are to tremble at his word. And so uh, yes. I just love and respect what you're doing, Mark. 
Yeah, thank you. Okay, so the question is, for the resources, um, I'll, I'll say three things because I've already mentioned exegetical fallacies and biblical words and their meaning. I've got posts on this on the Logos blog, which is at logos.com slash grow now uh, as of recently. I'll, the, here's the three things. I will mention Logos Bible software and people cast shade on it because it does cost money, but Bro, I will I have it. tell you I have it. that when I was a poor seminary student just trying to make it in this world and I was spending zero monies on anything, somehow I managed to afford the gold package because it was that worthwhile to me. And why was it worthwhile? I always think of Ephesians 4. That's my defense for being a Bible teacher. It's my defense for um, uh, for the existence of Logos. Christ gave teachers to his church. And are you going to, despite, as the King James says, despise the, you know, the gift of Christ? So I'm not saying you're going to despise Christ's gift if you don't buy Logos. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you're going to be looking for good teachers if you really believe <laughs> Ephesians 4. Um, and that's what Logos does for me. It's giving me access to the Bible text, and it's giving me access to great teachers. Second thing, I've been holding the NIV Reader's Bible here throughout some of this interview, and the Reader's Bible format um, removes all chapter and verse numbers, and often, depending on the Bible, headings, although I tend to still like having headings um, in my Bible, so that you're kind of forced to look at the Bible in a little bit of a new way and to, I think, think about the context more often. I don't like, I, I'm not on a, a crusade against verse by verse formats, um, but I did produce the Bible Typography Manifesto years ago, and uh, one of the most popular videos on my YouTube channel is uh, why Bible typography matters. I think it really does matter for good Bible reading, and I think if you haven't tried it, you should try it. And third, this is gonna kind of come out of, um, I'm not sure left field or right field because he's a political moderate, but John McWhorter, I've been on his podcast, Lexicon Valley, and uh, that was like literally the highlight of all the time that I spent on my book, Authorized. Uh, I got to be interviewed by him, and he's just a hero of mine. He's an atheist. He does not like Christianity, actually, but he isn't mean about it publicly, except in his book, Woke Racism, by the way. He is actually, I couldn't finish that book because he was kind of mean to, toward Christianity, but he's an awesome popularizer of linguistics. And I've listened to, I think, every single episode of the show uh, since he became the host. And uh, some of them I've listened to more than once because he's so fun to listen to. And you, I just feel like you gain a sense for what language is. And I've, I've recently did have somebody who heard me give this advice years ago and has been doing that and testified. Yes, it does help. He's really gained a sense for how language works. And he's, you just need to be reminded over and over again, Hebrew and Greek are normal, were normal human languages. And my fear in the conservative circles that I'm in is typically the danger, the ditch that we're in is over-interpretation, adding too much meaning rather than failing to get enough out. Uh, other parts of the church may have a different problem. I know my world better than uh, than theirs, but if you kind of live in my world, if you watch Remnant Radio, you're probably somewhat more nerdy than the average. Um, I would say listen Amen. to John McWhorter, read some of his books. <laughs> Yeah, and and I, I want to be very clear. I was I was joking about the logos. I have logos. Michael has logos. Good. Dawson has logos. We all have logos. Miller has logos. Like we we're fans cool of logos. Logos. If you're out there, I like you and I like your product. I just know that there was a time in when you know I, I mentioned at the top of the show my baloney didn't have a first name and that price tag was was <laughs> it was decent. So oh, I, I get it. Pain. Anyway, guys, yeah. uh, Mark, thank you so much for coming on and 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 uh, yeah, taking your time you. to be with us. Uh, your your content is inspiring. It's educational. Uh, it's really it's it's really succinct. You know, I think if you go and you spend twenty minutes on Mark's channel, you're going to get the same kind of content you're going to get on forty minutes on somewhere else because he's just he's whittled down the information to just the punchiest moments. And I really find his style of communication and the way that he delivers his information really really helpful so i want to tell all of you go over there and subscribe to mark ward's channel um it is spelled like it sounds so uh, i will leave a link in the description for you guys who want to go check that out but additionally make sure to like and subscribe to remnant radio and if you want to support the channel because uh you've been blessed by this episode or other episodes we've done i'd encourage you to do that there's links for paypal or patreon in the description of the video you can give a one-time gift on PayPal or a reoccurring giver on Patreon. You'll get access to extra content. So it's five bucks a month. You'll get access to that content. But you can always send me an email if you want it for free because and you can't afford it. we're releasing all of our, our send videos that's early, right? right? So yeah, yeah. you so, can access that on Patreon. All that's there. Excellent. Yeah, uh, that's Mark, there. thanks again for coming on, man. Yep. Thank you guys so much. 
Blessings, guys. God bless you guys. Have a great week.